All right, so welcome everyone. This is our second session in sort of our, our June uh, reinforcement learning series. So welcome. So this, today's topics are dynamic programming and Monte Carlo methods. Um, they, they go well together. We're loosely following the Sutton and Bartow book. So first, um, I can advance my slide here. Uh, just a word about how to participate. So this is not super formal, okay? So um, I'm gonna be the discussion leader, but everyone's welcome to participate. Um, feel free at any time to just stop, ask questions. Um, feel free to use the chat, talk about each other, you know, talk to each other, whatever. Um, the intent is obviously to learn a little bit about machine learning, learn about reinforcement learning, but also it's just to have fun. So um, also give feedback if things are going too fast, if you want, um, want to see something else. So today, um, I don't know if, um, if we're going to get through all the content or if like last time it's going to be two sessions. So I think I'm pretty good learn learning about machine learning, but I'm not very good at planning agendas. I always try to pack too much into it. And so I don't seem to be able to break that habit. Um, here's our agenda briefly. So we're going to recap, um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So how we formulate reinforcement learning, the Bellman equations. We're talking about dynamic programming. And so in dynamic programming, as we'll see, um, we'll talk about policy evaluation as well as policy improvement. And that leads us to policy iteration and we can kind of generalize this. And then for Monte Carlo methods, um, we will be doing sampling. And so we'll be able to again, do, do prediction to find value functions, uh, do control for best policies. And that gets us into the, the the discussion of on policy and off policy methods in reinforcement learning. So Monte Carlo methods are gonna be our first real uh, technique that we can apply to non-trivial problems. And so it'll be, it'll be really nice. And there is a blackjack code example. Um, there's a blackjack example in the book and we're very fortunate that um, there's on GitHub a, a uh, repo that does all of the uh, examples and diagrams in the book in Python. And so uh, we can go through that at the end. Okay, so uh, we'll start with just a recap on um, what is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is about an agent uh, learning about an environment. It interacts with the environment and it's performing sequential actions. So reinforcement is very fundamentally, intrinsically uh, time-oriented. It's sequential decision-making. So really the main and just about only um, information that this agent gets from its environment is this reward signal. And so it's a scalar number. It's just a single number. And so for every action that it takes, um, the agent will get a numeric signal and its goal is to maximize the total, the sum of all of those rewards over time. So how do we model um, formally something that's, that's set up like this? What we do is we use Markov decision processes. And so in this case, you say this environment has different states that you can be in. And in each state, there's some number of actions that you can choose. And then we get our reward signal. And once we get our reward signal, we'll get placed in a new state. So if you look at this sort of uh, domain of Markov decision processes, MDPs, what you see is that for the most part, this does not in any way limit what you can represent. Um, what it does do is it requires that you pack a lot of information into the state. So um, I was just thinking about, so like, for example, if you were modeling the decision-making that a, a manager, a team makes uh, as a baseball team, right? Well, you may want to know um, how many outs there are in a given inning. You might want to know if there's players on base. So apologies to anyone, if you, any of you, if you don't follow baseball. But, but in reality, like some of the decision-making, you know, it depends on what the score is. Are you down by one run versus up by one run, what you would do? So you'd probably want that information in the state. You probably want to know how late in the game it is. If it's if it's the very last inning, if it's the ninth inning, then you might do something different than if it's super early in the game. 
and I could go on and on. You know, it may depend on uh, um, how long has the, the 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 pitcher been in there, and is he at the at the limit of how many pitches he could throw. And so, again, the the complexity with MDPs isn't uh, can you represent something as an MP, MD, MDP? The real issue is just that in order to model something as a Markov decision process, um, what you have to do is you have to put a lot of information into the state. And so the, the size of the state, the number of different states can explode exponentially very quickly once you start throwing a lot, a lot of different things in the field. And so that's really where uh, the, the complexity comes from, not if you can model it as a Markov decision process, but rather just how big it gets very quickly. So the key thing about MDPs is that to transition at any point in time only depends on your current state. So people use the term memoryless. okay? It does not matter how you got to state 17, whether you got there in one step or whether you got there in 5 million steps. If you're in state 17, everything that you need to know about what's going on is captured in the information of state 17. So you don't need to know what happened beforehand. And mathematically, this allows us to do certain techniques. The fact that we don't need to know how we got here or where we were previously or what actions we took previously. We only need to know the fact that we're in this state. Uh, for me, sometimes I find it easier to visualize, to think about MDPs as a graph. And so in the book, there's a very simple one here. It has only two states, high battery, low battery. And so the actions are these little uh, filled in dark black circles and the, the uh, directed edges uh, show, you know, what state you wind up in after you take an action. In some cases, you'll see there's an action and there's only one arrow, uh, one edge coming out of it. And, that, and that's fine, that's deterministic. You do this action and you will wind up back in this state. On the other hand, sometimes you see uh, the environment can have some randomness to it where sometimes you go one way with certain probability. Sometimes you end up in a different state with another probability. So we have a bunch of notation um, in re reinforcement learning. So we talked about this last session. I'm just gonna go through this very quickly, uh, but your states are S's, your actions are A, your rewards are R. We, we typically talk about future rewards being discounted, being not worth as much as current rewards. And so we multiply future rewards by this discount rate gamma. Uh, you can set gamma equal to one, in which case there's no discounting. And I didn't talk about this too much last time, but um, it does it does seem to keep coming up in some of the equations in the book. So I thought I would include uh, G is, is what they use to talk about the return. So that's the sum of all the rewards, not just the next action step, but from there all the way to the end. Um, this function P, talks about that probability that you wind up in whatever particular state after you choose an action. So again, if there's only one state you wind up in, then you're gonna wind up in that state with probability one. But P could have lots of different ways things could go. So if you imagine um, a, a game of poker where there's a new card dealt, well, now there's roughly 52 different states that you could wind up in uh, based on which card comes up. When we're trying to solve reinforcement learning problems, we may estimate the, the value, so the, the total return, the G. We may estimate that for a given state. So what's, um, for when you're in this particular position, um, what's, what's the total return you can get from here? That value function's called V. If you're estimating the value of not just what state you're in, but a state and a particular action that you choose, then we call that value function Q. And in terms of, uh, I think of it as the word strategy, in terms of the strategy, so what actions are you going to choose in the various states? Um, we call that a policy. So a policy, again, can be deterministic, where when you're in state 17, you always do action three. So then that would just be 100%. Um, you're going to do action three. But you can also have mixed policies. You can have randomness. And so in poker, you may say, in this situation, 10% of the time I'm gonna bluff, 90% of the time I'm going to bet money. 
Um, and then finally, in terms of notation, whenever you see the star, that means we're now talking about an optimal choice, an optimal policy. So pi star is the optimal policy. V star is the value, the, the um, discounted sum of rewards that you can get from that given state. All right, so that's our whirlwind recap through um, um, how reinforcement learning problems are set up. Any comments, questions, anything before uh, we start talking about dynamic programming? I, I have a question about the state. So when, when we're talking mm -hmm. about state, you, you mentioned that you have like a full representation there like given a certain state you need to know that there's a certain action and then you don't necessarily need to know about all of the history to get you to that point right and you can do that mm -hmm. just having a state that kind of sufficiently describes the scenario right so even in like a game of baseball yeah. you can just say it's this out it's this inning it's this score etc cetera, etc cetera. there's this many people on base and so you can just get to the point where you've mm -hmm. just described pretty much any scenario, right? Yeah, the, the, the complexity is that depending on the nature of the problem, so like baseball, you know, there's, we can come up with a fairly simple set of things that would be the official state of a baseball game, right? But the reality is like, in the real world, there's other information like, oh, the hitter is the other team's best hitter. You might like, you know, do something slightly different in terms of how aggressively you pitch that person because you might be more willing to walk that guy because he's their home run hitter versus their worst hitter. You might say, don't ever walk him if you have to just throw the ball down the middle and challenge him and, you know, mm -hmm. see if he can actually hit the ball, yeah. right? So so depending on the, 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 the thing, you know, if it's, if it's games like Go, Chess, the rules are really well defined. And so you can say, yes, I have captured perfectly the nature of this particular problem. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to a real world situation, you have to actually decide uh, what are you going to, are there any other subtleties that you're going to include? I suppose and, in the baseball example, that's the difference between treating your players as indistinguishable versus distinguishable entities. Yeah, yeah, so so like, I mean, let's just say you're doing, um, um, you're, you're, there's an example in the book that's like a bioreactor or whatever. So, so let's say you're producing these like two chemicals or, or something like that. And you know what the, the value of each of those chemicals is. And so you can kind of optimize for the balance between those two chemicals. But hypothetically, I could say to you, you, you may want to model this problem knowing the fact that the price of one chemical has been going up and the price of the other has been going down. So that throws in yet another wrinkle into your problem, right? And then you could also decide to throw in, well, what if the price of your ingredients was changing? Well, what if, what if, what if? So ultimately, you have to decide how you're going to model, how much complexity you're going to put into, um, into modeling you know, your particular problem. But Again, I often talk about games because they are more black and white. And so when you talk about backgammon or Go or chess, then we can all agree that this, this set of information completely captures everything you possibly want to know about the state of the game. And I think, I think in later chapters, we talk about so that that's for MDPs is when you need to have the kind of fully explained state. And later, I think we'll talk about when you don't have that assumption, right? So maybe we don't have to worry about that too much because we'll have techniques that, that cover that eventually. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, and in fact, um, I think even so far, there've been a few comments, a few hints in the book that says, oftentimes whatever you're modeling isn't, exactly completely following the, 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 the Markov property where it's memoryless. And so if you had a choice of having a state space that was you know, 10 to the sixth times bigger or just using the simplification, which doesn't quite 100% hold, then you know, maybe what you do is you try the smaller problem and then just see if the solution 
good enough, even though it's not perfect. Yeah. Okay. So um, last thing is we talked about the Bellman equation. So this is this is really important for understanding the theory behind the different learning algorithms. And so the Bellman equation here, um, this is the Bellman equation for value functions. So this says the value for given state S, and again, the value is just um, the discounted sum of all future rewards, okay? We're gonna express this recursively where we're gonna say, we're gonna add up all the different um, actions you could take from this state. And for each of those actions, we're gonna add up all the different uh, rewards and new states that you could wind up in. And for each of those, we have this uh, formula that we'll just see over and over and over again, which is the immediate reward we get plus gamma, the discount factor, times whatever the, um, the value is for the new state that we wind up in. So this is our recursive formulation. So we're not saying if we know exactly what this value is, but we're simply saying at all times for all policies, whether the policy is a good policy or bad policy, the Bellman equation always holds at all times, which is that the value for one state S is just the sum of all the returns and discounted rewards that you can get from all the successor states that you could wind up in one action later, just one time step later. That's all this thing is saying is that just, you know, if there's 10 things you can do, then the value for being in this current state is just the sum of the 10 different um, uh, rewards and values of where you can wind up. So this is true at all times. If you find the best policy, the, uh, oh, sorry, one more slide. Um, and so then um, there's backup diagrams is the, is the name for this type of diagram, which is another way to see and think about this. And so for me, I like visual things. And so you can see on here that all the different choices you could make in terms of your actions, and you might only have one, it could be deterministic, but but doesn't matter if it's one or if it's multiple. Those are the, 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 the different choices highlighted in green here. Um, you're gonna add up all those. And for each one of those choices, you're gonna add up the different states that you could wind up in. Again, it could be just one or it could be multiple. And for each of those in red, it's again, it's just the current reward, the one step reward plus the discounted return um, from thereafter from whatever new state S prime that you wind up in. All right, so this Bellman equation is always true for all policies, good policies, bad policies. Value of a state is the value, the sum of the probabilities, um, so it's the weighted sum of all the different values of the states that you could wind up in next. If you have an optimal policy, so this is the best policy, and for finite MDPs, it can be proved that there, there is always um, a unique um, value function that is the optimal uh, value function for optimal policies, the maximum that you can get from the system. So um, we can we can then say for the previous Bellman equation, um, that's always true, but then there's a stronger property that's true if you are using the best policy, not just any policy pi, but the best one. So for V star, basically you can show down here that um, if you choose the, the, the best, the maximum action, and you just look at that branch. So that's the probability of the different states that you can get into. And again, it's the, um, reward plus the discounted future uh, returns. So then you can say recursively that when you have the optimal policy, then V star will always be equal to the maximum, the best of all the different actions that you can take. And you can also express this in terms of uh, state action pairs. So again, that's our function called Q. And so for Q, you can express it recursively that you have the different states that you can wind up in. And if you sum up for each of the states that you could wind up in, um, the reward plus the discounted future returns for all the actions that you could take from those successor states, then whenever you have an optimal policy, then 
the value for your current state and action is always going to equal the max of all of those. So I, um, the math can sometimes be, you know, when I look at this, it's a lot of letters and symbols or whatever, but basically it's just saying that by definition, if you said that Q, this is the best policy, then, then when you look at Q, you better actually be using the maximum value because if you're not using the maximum value, then it's not the best policy. And that's all that it's really saying. But as we will see, there is value to seeing this formal formalization where you write a function recursively as a function of, in this case, its successor states. All right, so that's, um, that's the Bellman equations. So with, with that terminology and those equations, we can tackle different algorithms for learning. We'll have to deal with the amount of memory and the amount of compute needed. And then one of the really hard things is um, trying to get these models to converge quickly. We still have challenges around uh, reward design. And so imagine you're playing Go and the signal that you have is for every move you make, basically the reward is zero, but you get a plus one when you win the game and you get a minus one when you lose the game. That is very sparse, okay? So you're going to do a whole lot of actions before you, um, before you finally get a, a reward signal of plus one or minus one, which leads you then to sort of a credit assignment problem. So you have this trajectory of 75 moves that you made. Well, which actions were the good ones and which ones were the bad ones? How do you know? All 75 of those actions probably did not contribute equally to you winning the game. And then finally, we also have a problem of exploration versus exploitation. And so in some of the different algorithms, um, it's gonna be really hard to know like, well, what would the value of, you know, folding this poker hand be when you had two aces? Because what if you never try it, then you're never gonna know, what, you know whether it would be a good or a bad outcome. All right, so, um, so that's our recap of uh, reinforcement learning so that we can jump off from here and start about uh, start talking about a way we can mathematically solve, get accurate value functions um, for problems that are well-known, well-defined. So that's gonna be dynamic programming. All right, see a bunch of messages in the chat. Any, anything, um, any questions, anything we wanna talk about? We're, we're still kind of just discussing the, the state and, and mm -hmm. whether history is included and in, in, in Markov models got brought up. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything specifically to discuss there. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the formalism is that if you're truly doing, you know, a Markov decision process, then you don't need to know anything else about how you got there, you just need to know where you are. So um, we talk about the blackjack game, okay? Um, in blackjack, if you have 16 and your goal is to get as close as, as possible to 21 without going over, in blackjack, it really doesn't matter whether, um, let, me, let me say that slightly differently. Um, when you first look at the game conceptually, it doesn't matter whether you, you got to 16 by having a 10, a two, and then getting a four that adds up to 16, or whether you got a 10 and a three, and then you got another three and that adds up to 16, you know? Um, so that, that sort of that history of how you got there doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is that you have 16 and that obviously uh, anything five or less would be a good additional card, anything six or more, and you're gonna be over 21, you're gonna lose the game, okay? Um, under certain circumstances, um, you, you could, again, we, we can talk about how to be really complex. So if you're, if you're counting cards and you're playing with a single deck of cards, then actually it might matter more whether you know you got to 16 by getting six different small cards versus if you got a 10 and a six or whatever 
Um, but in the extreme case, if you talk about an infinitely large deck, um, then ultimately all we need to know is that you have 16. We don't really need to know anything else. So I don't know, but I hope that helps. All right, so let's talk about our first topic, dynamic programming. So dynamic programming is cool. Um, so my understanding is that Richard Bellman, uh, uh, you know, basically like came up with this uh, um, dynamic programming business, like what, back in the 50s or whatever. And so it's been applied to other areas. The, the, basic, the basic principle of dynamic programming is that we're going to break something down into sub problems. And it's particularly helpful if those sub problems overlap a lot. Uh, and then what we can do is if we can optimize those sub problems and if we sort of take into, um, uh, in the theoretical sense, if we sort of um, um, cache uh, those, those, different, those different solutions to the sub problems, then we can use those cache values over, over again and we can build things up. And so specifically in reinforcement learning, dynamic programming is used to compute optimal policies. And it requires this particular technique, this is a building block, okay? This technique requires that you have a perfect model of the behavior of your environment, okay? So that means that in practice, this is not necessarily that useful um, if you're trying to do reinforcement learning for a self-driving car, you don't have a perfect model of, of all the probabilities of everything that can happen on the road. Uh, we don't have this full knowledge. It's also somewhat expensive to compute, so people don't necessarily use dynamic programming. But again, it's a very useful building block because what you'll see is that there's pieces of dynamic programming that show up in all the algorithms that we talk about next, afterwards. All right. Um, so, so if you go back to um, the first Bellman equation, and it says that basically the value function for a given state can be expressed as the sum, the weighted sum, of all the values of these other successor states. Well, if you have n states, then you can have um, at most n successor states. You could wind up back in your own state, and you have n minus 1 other states that you could wind up in. Um, so it, let's just say you have a particular problem and you have 100 states. So if you want to know the value of uh, state number one, then there's 99 other states that if you knew those, at, at, you may not be able to wind up in all of them. But worst case scenario, if, uh, you need to know those other 99. You need to know the, the, um, the value function for states 2 through 100. Well, what about how would you compute the value for state two. Well, for state two, it can be expressed as, again, all the possible successor states, which are one through 100. So it's the same 100 successor states that you could possibly need. In fact, for every state, it's just going to be those same 100. And so this is that, that mathematical thing that we talked about, where you have sub problems that overlap a lot. The things you need in order to compute the value function for state one are the exact same things you need to compute uh, the value for, for state two, for state three, and so on. So that's, that's the sort of the more theoretical underpinnings. So what we do in dynamic programming is we take a look at this Bellman equation. So here's the value. And once again, it's expressed recursively as a function of the value of all the other states. Now, given the Bellman equation um, for, again, for a fully defined MDP, we can actually, um, where, where, where the number of states that, um, here is known, uh, we can actually write one equation, one Bellman equation for each state. And when we say that the dynamics of the environment are completely known, that means that we know the values for this P function for every possible S and for every possible A. So this whole part of this equation completely goes away, we can just replace these with actual numbers, okay? And if we have a certain policy that we're following pi, then that means that we know the probability that we're gonna do with any particular action in, in that state. And so we can replace this whole part with hard numbers, okay? 
So then it just becomes some particular number times the reward um, plus gamma times the value of other states. All right. And we know what the rewards are because we said we know the complete dynamics. And so that's just a number. And so then basically the value of um, a given state S is just going to be at most some bunch of numbers, you know, um, adding up uh, times the value of these various other states. And so you could say that, you know, the value of state one equals, let's just say hypothetically one half times the value of state two plus one quarter times the value of state three plus one third times the value of state four. That's a linear equation in um, n unknowns, which is the number of the other states. And how many of these equations do we have? Well, we have one Bellman equation for every state. So this just gives us a linear e system of equations um, in n unknowns with n equations. And if you study linear algebra, if you know anything, then if you have n linear equations and n unknowns, you can solve that. I don't remember what the time of that is, n cubed or something like that. Um, but um, it can be done. Uh, dynamic programming uses a slightly different approach, okay? So that would be just sort of this, this mathematical direct brute force solution. What we're gonna do is we're gonna solve this iteratively. We're gonna, we're gonna approximate it. And by doing so, this will actually lead us down the path towards these other reinforcement learning algorithms. So, in dynamic programming, what we do is we initialize. We say we're going to start with some random estimate for what the value of every state is. So this could be as simple as we just say it's zero for every single state. And what we're going to do is we're going to tweak the Bellman equation. So this first one here, this is the regular Bellman equation. And once again, this is true at all times for all policies, for all states. And we're going to turn this into an update rule that says, if we have our kth estimate for the value of all of these states, then by applying this formula, what we can do is we can calculate um, our next iteration, our k plus one value for every single state. So again, the, the, the Bellman equation says this, this um, is a, um, this is an equality up here if we had the perfectly accurate value um, for all the successor states. But we don't, we just have an estimate. In this case, if we initialize everything to zero, we have a pretty lousy estimate, but nevertheless. So if this is not the actual value, if this is only an estimate, then this equality won't hold. And so what'll happen is if you actually sum up all this stuff, you're gonna get a different number than whatever your current estimate is. And so dynamic predict, Dynamic programming just simply says, okay, we'll sum all this stuff up, get that new value, and then you're just going to replace the current estimate of the value with the new one. So we can do this. We can start out, like I said, with everything zero. And then typically what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna sweep through, we're gonna go and say, okay, so if we just plug in all the different numbers, then what is the new value for state zero? What is the new value for state one? What is the new value for state two, state three? All the way through all of them. And then after we've um, computed them all, uh, then we can go and we can update. We can say, okay, good, fine. Now let's, let's overwrite all of those estimates and let's do this again. And we can keep iterating and and each iteration, we just keep track of how much did the value function change for each state. And whenever we get to a point where we pick some arbitrary stopping point, so theta could be 0 0.001, um, as soon as none of the states have changed in value uh, by more than this small number theta, let's say 0 0.001, then we know that we're very close. And so that we now have a very accurate estimate of um, the value function under our given policy. So, uh, um, what was I gonna say? Um, so if we actually got to the point where all the updates are zero, then that means that we've nailed it. We actually have the completely perfectly accurate value um, for every state. Uh, but in practice, we, we don't need to get to the point where it's zero. We can just get it to converge to be um, 
you know, reasonably close. And so it's really cool. So basically the Bellman equation says this is true um, if you have the accurate value function. But what we've now done is we've turned that into an iterative process for stepping closer and closer and closer to getting the true um, value. And so it's pretty straightforward. If we just do this over and over again, then this algorithm is called iterative policy evaluation. And so given any policy, you can start with just like the random policy where all actions are equally probable. Um, then just doing this step over and over and over again, it will actually calculate your, um, your, your reasonably arbitrarily close estimate for the value function. All right, let me pause here. Um, I actually have a video that I want to show, um, but um, let me just pause here and see if you guys are with me, if you guys have any questions. There's there's one in the chat. Okay. Uh, so they're, they're asking, does this assume that the parameters do not change as we iterate? Um, we, okay. Um, so if the parameters we're talking about are the, 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 the two things that you could change, I mean, there's, there's our policy pi. Um, and so we are calculating the value function for a given policy. So we're not changing pi. Uh, the other thing is the environment. So we're assuming the environment is not changing um, while we're doing this. And later on, I, I don't, I haven't gotten that far ahead in the book. I'm sure this will be sort of generally addressed, um, but, um, but even if the environment is changing, it's probably changing slowly. And so for, for you know, a short period of time, the, the dynamic, dynamics of P are not going to utterly change, you know, instantly. Um, I, think, I think the environment changing is encoded in the state. So it's assumed to change and change and that's why you're but the parameters i guess i guess what you're saying is the parameters of the environment how how it was generated sort of the, the initial state of the of the universe doesn't change yeah and for certain kinds of things you can just encode that in the state if you know that whatever um i just want to mention from mathematical point of view that for the policy to converge to some number, so it will be some kind of number and not in something increasing infinitely, we should have the gamma parameter not increasing. And other values should not be increasing, they should be bounded by some values as well. So then it will, you know, and then it will be computable from mathematical point of view, because we can compare it with a geometric series and geometric series converge when gamma is less than one. Uh, I'm sorry if it, you know, if I would, uh, I don't know if you remember what is a geometric series is. I'm sorry for this. This, you know, again, from poorly theoretical point of view, it should be converged. The value should be a number, right? It cannot be mm -hmm. anything infinite. And for this to, to be a number, we need some restrictions. We need for the gamma to be always less than one. We need for other values to be bounded and not increasing infinitely as well. And well, probability is obviously not increasing. And yeah, rewards should be not increasing too. They should be bounded. There should be upper bound for them. Thank you, Maya. Sorry, I'm distracted. I, I just it's realized my, my, my computer crashed um, uh, last night. And so I had this, this video that I wanted to show all queued up and I just realized suddenly, oh my God, all my windows are gone. I no longer have the video that I was looking for um, um, uh, perfectly. To, to Maya's up. point uh, um, about uh, those parameters that need to be bounded, I'm not sure that includes numbers associated with the environment like this, uh, like you could have an infinite environment that your recurrent learning algorithm is acting in, such as uh, an environment in which the score can be unlimited. There's no bound on the score in a video game, uh, if, if the, if, for some video games. 
And that doesn't prevent this from converging because there's some finite number of steps in the game and finite number of good actions you can take that are gonna converge on average to the, the, the value of the policy. I was curious to probe that mathematical perspective a little bit further. Um, so, I mean, what, what, we've, uh, what we've shown earlier, well, well, what you're essentially looking for is a steady state solution, right? Where the parameters are not updating from one K to the next K. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, under what conditions does a steady state exist? Um, might there be more than one steady state? Might there be none? Do we, do we have any intuition on that? So I have been uh, generally in, in going through here and, and doing this, this somewhat higher level overview of reinforcement learning. I've been generally not focusing, focusing as much on the proofs Okay, so like the proofs of convergence and, and whatever. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that if we just simply talk about a finite MDP, okay, then there's guaranteed to be an optimal policy and um, all optimal policies will have the same value function V star and dynamic programming, assuming again, that you know completely the dynamics of the environment. So you know the P function exactly then it's, it's, um, it's guaranteed that you do this and it will converge, converge fairly quickly. And, and you're not relying on some linearity assumptions there? No, no. Um, I mean, fundamentally an MDP cannot be that complex because, because the only thing you're allowed is P. So you choose an action and you can have uh, probabilities that you will wind up in different states, okay? But it's just, it's just probabilities. You you can't have, again, you're not allowed to use history. You're not allowed to use anything else. So so there's no, there's no nonlinear terms. Okay, um, you can kind of say, well, what if you had something that did have that weirdness? Well, then you'd have to encode that into the state, and so you'd have many many more states, but it would still be linear with respect to any given state. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. Thanks. Okay. All right, you so know, let me... About infinity, infinite number of states. I once talked with one um, computer science professor and I mentioned infinity that uh, I was surprised that uh, in the book, which I read about computational complexity and infinity was not mentioned at all, on which he told me infinity does not exist. So in real life, we usually don't have infinity. But in any case, if something uh, is growing, that there could be more complicated dependencies on other variables. They should be decreasing, but well, it is too complex to go into this. Yeah, so, so what I'll say is that the, the if you really like this topic and you and you want to go into the theory, then by all means, they do cover this. Um, uh, but for the purpose of us, we can just sort of say, we'll talk about episodic um, tasks, which are not infinite, and, um, and just know that other people have actually thought about it and there are extensions and you can kind of use all these algorithms, um, even if it's, if it's not episodic, if it's continuous and it just goes on forever. All right, so um, the, the video that I have here um, does an animation and it kind of goes through uh, iterative policy evaluation for a, a very simple grid world example that's in, in the book. I thought they did a good job. And so I thought there's no, no point in reinventing the wheel. And I figured I would just uh, show this to you guys. So let me show this to you and then um, we can see if there's any questions. I don't know that, I mean, I think I went kind of quickly through what is iterative policy evaluation, but I think maybe um, it'll be clear from, from the video example.
I don't know if we get broadcast sound when you're just screen sharing. I, I actually, that's why I stopped sharing was to, uh, but I think I need to turn the volume up. It's the problem because I'm not hearing it either. I think you need to share computer sound. With the terminal yeah. options. located in the top left and bottom right yeah. corners. The terminal state is shown in two places. You guys hear it? But formally, it is the same state. Yeah. Now we can hear it. Oh, the reward will be minus so one weird, for every now transition. Now I don't hear anything. Since the problem is episodic, let's consider the undiscounted case of gamma equals one. There are four possible actions in each state. Up, down, left, and right. Each action is deterministic. If the action would move the agent off the grid, it instead leaves the agent in the same state. Now let's evaluate the uniform random policy, which selects each of the four actions one quarter of the time. The value function represents the expected number of steps until termination from a given state. The order we sweep through the states is not important since we are using the two array version of the algorithm. Let's assume we sweep the states first from left to right, and then from top to bottom. We never update the value of the terminal state as it is defined to be zero. We initialize all the values in V to zero. The initial values stored in V prime are irrelevant since they will always be updated before they are used. We can now begin our first iteration with the update to state one. To compute the update, we have to sum over all actions. Consider the left action first which has probability one quarter under the uniform random policy. The dynamics function p is deterministic here, so only the reward and value for 1s prime contributes to the sum. The sum includes minus one for the reward and zero for the value of the terminal state. Since we initialized all state values to zero and the reward for each transition is minus one, the computation for all the other actions will look much the same. The result is that v prime of state 1 is set to minus 1. Next, we move to state 2. We first evaluate the term in the sum for the left action. Again, the action probability is 1 quarter, and in this case, the next state is state 1. Although we have updated the value of state 1 already, the version of the algorithm we are running will use the old value stored in v. So the value for state 1 in the update is still 0. Again, all the other actions will look much the same. The result is that v prime of state 2 is also set to minus 1. In fact, since every state value is initialized to 0, every state's value will be set to minus 1. After completing this full sweep, we copy the updated values from v prime to v. This has been only one sweep. Let's discuss now the full algorithm for iterative policy evaluation. Take any policy we want to evaluate. Initialize two arrays, v and v prime. We can initialize these however we No sound right now. No, I, I, I paused it. OK. Um, all right, that was really weird because I couldn't hear anything. So I was sort of just. Uh, trusting that you guys could actually hear it. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, so does that example make sense for for grid world in terms of uh, we're we're calculating a value uh, and we're just looking at the current estimate for all the the, the states next to us, and then uh, we're able to to calculate the value for every given state and then once we've done that then we copy over the whole thing yeah with it everybody good so far could you could you rewind it like 10 seconds so we could just look at the board again so understanding the the zeros there can you talk us through what's happening there. So the negative ones is saying, basically you go to this square, you're getting a negative one, right? So the, the reward right now, this is just counting how long. So the reward for every action is minus one. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's why you see all these minus ones. So when they're doing the math, they're saying, if you're starting in this square, 
If you go left, the reward is minus one, you wind up here and our current estimate is zero. They're all zero. So if you go down here, then the reward is minus one. If you go to the right, the reward is minus one. And if you go up, then you bounce and you wind up back in your same state, but the reward is still minus one. And so that's why for each of these 25% these probability actions that you choose, you're gonna get a reward of minus one. Mm -hmm. And the, the minus one is coming from every time step, you get a penalty of one. You're trying to get to the other side in the, in the shortest number of steps possible. So they penalize it by saying minus one for every step that you take. Correct. You're trying to get to one of these two corners, either upper left or lower right. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's, that's the, the structure of this grid world game. So that's where these minus ones came from. And so it, it looks kind of silly because we started out with all estimates being zero. And so in fact, um, this, this gamma times future is just always gonna be zero because we started out with zeros. Okay. So I'm gonna keep playing then. After completing this full sweep, we copy the updated values from V prime to V. This has been only one sweep. Let's discuss now the full algorithm for iterative policy evaluation. Take any policy we want to evaluate. Initialize two arrays, V and V prime. We can initialize these however we like, but let's set them to zero. We just saw how one sweep of iterative policy evaluation works. Let's look at how we compute multiple sweeps and determine how the algorithm stops. The outer loop continues until the change in the approximate value function becomes small. We track the largest update to the state value in a given iteration. Let's call this delta. The outer loop terminates when this maximum change is less than some user-specified constant called theta. As discussed before, once the approximate value function stops changing, we have converged to vpi. Similarly, once the change in the approximate value function is very small, this means we are close to vpi. Let's pick up where we left off in our grid world example. We had just completed our first sweep. Let's use a value of 0.001 for the stopping parameter theta. The smaller the value we choose, the more accurate our final value estimate will be. We've already completed one iteration, and the maximum change in value was 1.0. Since this is greater than 0.001, we carry on to the next iteration. After the second sweep, notice how the terminal state starts to influence the value of the nearest states first. Let's run one more sweep. We see that now the influence of the terminal state has propagated further. Let's run a few more sweeps to see what happens. We can start to see how the value of each state is related to its proximity to the terminal state. Let's keep running until our maximum delta is less than theta. Here is the result we eventually arrive at. Our approximate value function has converged to the value function for the random policy. And we're done. That's it for this video. You should now understand. All right. So, um, were you guys able to follow? It's so weird. I can't hear the sound. Uh, were you guys able to follow that? How the first step, they just got the minus ones. But when they repeat and everything right was, was equal. But when they repeated, the, the value was no longer the same in every single state. Um, and gradually, the ones nearer the corners had the lower values. And the ones uh, farther away from the corners, you actually saw they had higher values. And again, this is the value function under the policy they chose. So they chose... The, the random policy where all four actions are equally 25% probable. Any questions? Uh, the interesting thing for me is that we get uh, integers at the end. Uh, does it mean that there's some, you know, nice convergence uh, rules for this? No, I think it's just uh, someone purposefully chose this problem to have round numbers. So on the on the negative 20s, those are all equal because we can understand that no matter what action you take, it's it's not reaching the terminal state, right? And so all of those are um, 
negative 20 because they're not going to reach the terminal state in the next action. Those negative 20s are because under this current policy of randomly choosing up, right, up, down, left, right equally, the expected value, the average amount of time before you randomly stumble into one of the terminal corners, the upper left, the lower right, the average is going to be 20 from any of those six squares that have a minus 20. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. If we didn't choose the random policy, then you would see slight differences potentially in those different squares. So this is just, I, I might have misunderstood this at the beginning. So this is just iterating the, the value. It's not iterating the policy yet. That's Correct. We haven't gotten to that yet. So this iterative policy evaluation will work for a single policy. And so, so um, it was at the very beginning, but, and I couldn't hear it, <laughs> but she said, we're going to choose up, down, left, right, randomly, equally 25% probability. And this is the value function. Oh, I think the, I think the discount factor here is gamma is one. There's no discounting. Okay. So that's the other reason why we got round numbers. Um, uh, and so you can think of this as an expected value. So, so you might randomly, if you start here, for example, you might randomly luck into going left twice and it'll only take you two steps. Uh, but on the other hand, you might just wander around doing a random walk for a long time. It might take you a hundred steps before you stumble into this square down here. Um, and the average of all those uh, can prove to be 20. Any other questions? All right. So let me go back. So this is iterative policy evaluation. So given a particular policy, this calculates the value function uh, for that policy. Um, so here's the video that we did. And in this case, you saw they were doing sweeps. So they calculated the, for each iteration, they calculated what the new value was, this V prime. And by the way, this is that thing again, where the true value function is lowercase little v, but they're doing estimates. And if you looked closely, you'll see they use capital V. So anytime we're using our estimated stuff, we use capital V or the capital Q. Um, and so once they calculated the update for every single state, the whatever, 14 of them, then they copied them over and then they did another iteration. So as, as Ryan actually provided the perfect segue, so that, great. So now you figured out what the value function is for this policy, but ultimately isn't our goal to get to finding better policies. And so for that, um, we can do policy improvement and policy improvement is actually much simpler. So policy improvement is just that we said we know the dynamics of the environment. So we know all the, 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 the transition probabilities. And we also know what the reward's gonna be. So what we can just look at is we can say that, hey, if there's an action that we could have taken, so for example, that, that, that square that had a 20 in it that Ryan mentioned, or minus 20. If we just went left, um, you know, that's gonna be better than just randomly going up, down, left, right, 25%. So what we can do is we just be greedy and say, based on the current values that we see, what if we just choose the action that right now under our current um, policy looks to be the best? Okay, and um, so there's no big long iteration. It's just, hey, just look at the maximum um, of all your successor states, which one's the best. Um, and if you do that, then that's policy improvement, all right? Formally, it's this arg max thing or whatever, but basically, you know, it's just, hey, um, you have a bunch, in this case of grid world, you have four successor states. 
just 100% of the time choose whichever one has the max value. If there's ties, then you, know, you can do whatever you want. Um, so we call this policy improvement. So now what we can do is we can combine policy evaluation and policy improvement. And so you can see the sequence where we start with a policy. Let's say it's the random policy where we do all actions equally. We run what we just saw, iterative, iterative policy evaluation, in order to get the value function for that current zeroth policy. We then do a step of policy improvement where we say, now we're changing our policy. Instead of it being 25% of each action, we're going to greedily do whichever action looks the best at the moment. That's our new policy, pi one. Now what we can do is we can run policy evaluation on that new policy and get a new value function. So once we have the V for pi one, we can say, okay, what if we now then greedily choose the best actions under that? And we can keep repeating and repeating and repeating until basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna to get to a point where you have a value function and you're gonna say, what is the new greedy policy? And it's exactly the same as the last time. There's no change. The values may be slightly different numbers, but the actions haven't changed at all. And if that's the case, then that means you now have pi star. You have the optimal policy. So this is just alternating between policy evaluation and policy improvement. And the name for this is policy iteration. Does that make sense? All right, so there's actually a second video. Um, for time reasons, I'm not going to uh, show that video, but basically um, um, what they show is that if you, um, if you were to look at where we computed those final values. Actually, I think I still have it on my screen here. Okay, so if you said for this particular minus 20, actually, let's go to this minus 20 here, okay? There's four successor states you could be in, up, down, left, and right. You're not gonna go up and you're not gonna go right. In this case, these are equal, so you could choose either one. You could go down or you could go left, all right? Um, so let's just say you go left. Then from this one, you've got four successor states and you're not gonna go right, you're not gonna go down, you can go up or left. Let's say you go left again. And then from here, you can choose a negative 18, a negative 20, wind up back at yourself minus 14, or you can choose a zero. So clearly you're gonna choose the zero. You're gonna choose up. And in fact, for this grid world example, when you do a single round, you're actually gonna be at the optimal policy. You will immediately just see from every square, you're just gonna go boom, 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 straight to the corner, done. Um, and so that's actually why uh, for the video, they actually make the problem harder. They change these blue squares to minus 10. Um, and what that does is that, and they only have one goal, they take away the lower right hand corner. And so what that does is that changes it so that if you're down here in this lower left region, instead of shooting straight up there, you actually have to take the long winding path to avoid these big heavy minus tens. And then they show that if you're like down here, it actually takes something like eight rounds before you wind up with the best policy that tells you um, go to the right instead of going up from this initial square. Um, so from here, we can just do a couple extensions um, we just have a couple more slides under dynamic programming. And so one of the things we can do is we can do value iteration. So in, in, the, um, in the policy iteration, we said, we're gonna do this policy evaluation, which runs for a number of cycles until we're less than theta. And then we'll do improvement. And then we'll do another round. Well, we don't have to do full rounds. And in fact, the, 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 the shortest way we can do it is we just do a single sweep, okay? So instead of doing iterate, 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 find the max, find a really close um, value for V, we just say, we'll just do it once. We know that it hasn't converged. We know that it's not perfect, but you know what? It's closer to the right value of V. And then we can do improvement. We can see if the greedy algorithm changes at all. And then we can do another round of improvement. And it turns out if you do the math, that um, what, what this value iteration looks like is 
you can actually uh, show that the value at, at step k plus one is just basically choosing the max because you're doing this greedy thing from these previous things. And holy cow, it turns out that this looks just like the Bellman optimality equation for values, except that one used to say, instead of saying VK plus one, it says V star in both places. Whoops, it says V star in both places. So again, this is just, um, I don't think we need to know it that deeply, but this just shows you how those Bellman equations really kind of underlie the relationships between this idea of our current state and our successor states. And so when we come up with these different algorithms, they always end up being slight tweaks of the, the Bellman equations. So it turns out that we can tweak it and extend it in other ways as well. And so one of the things that we can do is we don't have to do full sweeps, all right? So in that one, you saw that we said, oh, we're gonna, there was 14 states. We're gonna calculate all 14 states and then we're gonna update them. Well, if backgammon has 10 to the 20th states, that's gonna take forever just to do that. So, um, so we could do some subset of them, all right? In the extreme, we could just do one state. We could update the value of one state and then we could do improvement. Value of one state, do improvement. And there's a proof. I don't think the proof's even shown in the book. But as long as you eventually update all the values um, and that you hit all the, the, the different states values updates, you know, infinitely often over time, and as long as you do improvement, then this asynchronous version will also con uh, converge to pi star. And so what's cool about asynchronous is that now instead of this, instead of dynamic programming be this, this, this very theoretical thing that you're doing on this perfect model, you could say, oh, I could actually be experiencing the environment. And then those are the ones, uh, those actions that I experience um, are the ones that I update. And then what we'll see for this and for other algorithms down the road is that we can actually focus um, to do updates on some states more often than others. So when you're solving poker, which has zillions and zillions of states, it turns out that there's some actions that are just some, some very, the initial estimates very quickly show that they're bad, they're terrible options, okay? So if you have the best possible hand, two aces, you shouldn't fold and lose the game, okay? So you really don't have to like uh, um, test out and experiment all the other things that might happen after you fold. It's just, you know, it's just such a terrible move that you don't have to, you don't have to sample it as heavily. You can just, you can go for the more interesting you know, areas. And so those are some extensions. And with these various extensions, it gets us to this uh, um, concept of generalized policy iteration. And it just means that you're gonna do evaluation and you're gonna do improvement. And you're gonna do some amount of evaluation before you pause to do improvement. And technically you could do several evaluations in a row. They could be sweeps, they could not be sweeps. But as long as you're alternating and you're doing all of them a certain amount, non-zero amount, um, then um, it's guaranteed to, in, the, in, in theory, if you do this an infinitely long time, it will always converge. You will always get your optimal policy pi star. And a term that's introduced at the very end of the chapter is this uh, term, we use it elsewhere in, in machine learning, but here in reinforcement learning, they talk about bootstrapping. So bootstrapping means that we're basing values of states on our previous estimates um, from their successor states. And not all algorithms do bootstrapping. There's, there's benefits to bootstrapping. Bootstrapping tends to converge faster, okay? Um, but you can't always do it. That There's times when it, uh, it doesn't really work well. So hopefully this diagram on the right, um, if that, if that helps you, um, great, but it basically shows sort of this circle of evaluation and improvement. And there's another diagram that I don't love so much that I didn't include, uh, but it basically just shows that you're, you're always getting slightly better value functions. And that leads you to slightly better policies. And as long as you're just always doing slightly better, then um, again, it's a finite MDP. You can't just go off the rails. If you're getting better then at some point, you will just stop because you will be at the best and you can't get any better than the best. All right, so that's dynamic programming. Um, 
any any comments, questions as we kind of get to the the uh, end of our time today? I, if if no one else has a question, I'd like to take a shot at trying to to summarize the the different options there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. If anyone else has has a question that can precede me. Okay, can you can you go a few slides before to the to the policy evaluation? Uh, I'm not sure which you might have passed it or maybe i'm thinking of something from the from the video but my my understanding of this so this scenario we've got the grid world and we've got the policy evaluation what we're doing here is we have some policy right now it's just random it's just going 0.25 every direction um, and the policy evaluation we're just essentially just playing game after game after game until our, our evaluation of the spaces and the actions that we take hasn't changed, right? And so you're playing just a whole bunch of games and then finally you get an output and you say, this is pretty close to the evaluation of, of the, the reward of all of these moves. So that's the policy evaluation part. And it is, and the slight, the slight tweak in language I would make is you're not technically playing the games because you have a perfect model of how this environment works, you're not technically playing. You're just simply walking through. You're sweeping through every single one. So it's a little bit like you're saying, you know, you played all, all the games, but, but you don't have to actually play. You just know mm -hmm. what happens from every state. Yeah. And so you can just sort of systematically say, all right, from this state here, and then the second one, and then the upper right corner, and then what happens here, 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 oh and so on and so forth mm -hmm. yeah okay but again I, I introduced it it might have might have kind of gone by a little fast but we don't technically we don't have to do this okay if we know the dynamics of everything we have um the ability to do this system in this case there's 14 states 14 equations in 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 14 states for, in 14 variables and we could have just crunched this but what, what I think hopefully people will see is that, oh, you can kind of do this kind of a dynamic programming type of algorithm when you don't necessarily have perfect information. You just start with an estimate and then you keep improving that estimate. And that's basically all these future methods are going to build on this idea of you start with some estimate and you just keep improving it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's that's the policy evaluation is, is the process of, of I, I don't know the proper word, I, I, I still want to say play, um, evaluating. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that, you do the improvement, which is taking that knowledge of, of um, the evaluation and, and, and the understanding of the rewards and all of that stuff. And then you go and you actually take a step or, or many steps until you get convergence um, and you, you keep trying to improve it and then you evaluate that policy again. And so those two pieces together becomes policy iteration. So it's, it's um, policy evaluation, policy improvement, and those two together is policy iteration where you're just doing that process over and over again. Yep, uh, that's, ex that's exactly right. So. So we, we get some better estimate of what the value of our current policy, our current strategy, different actions we take. And then we just greedily say, is there an action that right now looks like it's better than the one that we're taking? Mm -hmm. Let's do that one more. And then we say, what's the value for if you do that? And then you say, okay, now based on this better value estimate, is there, is there an action that would looks better you know, based on our estimate, looks better than what we're doing now. Let's do that. And then you just you just keep doing that. And um, um, in the case of grid world, you know, it only took one step. You don't even have to repeat it. it 
immediately found the optimal policy. So at least you can see for simple problems, um, for tic-tac-toe, for grid world, whatever, it is going to come up with the optimal. One, it may take you a bunch of iterations to get the value function. But once you have the value function, you know, it's pretty easy to see, like chase that best value. And then you can get to optimality quite fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the end of the day, they use the term control, which means the best policy, the best, you know, choosing the best actions to take, right? You don't need sort of a perfect value function. All right. So if, you know, you proved in theory that the value of action one is, is six and the, the value of action two is only three, it's half as much. Okay. You could have a really bad estimate where your estimate of, of the value of, of action one is four and action, the value estimate for action two is one. And they're way off, you know, they're off by like 50, 60%. But as long as one is better than two, you actually already know the best policy, right? Mm -hmm. So so these values don't really need to be perfect. They just need to be sort of uh, uh, properly ordered. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can get to really good policies very quickly is because you don't need the perfect value numerically you just need them all to be sorted and if for every state you've got them sorted in the right order then you've got sort of the best policy mm -hmm. yeah i'm talking you know what sort of deterministics you know choose the best action 100 percent of the time you know but for a lot of situations you know that's that's essentially all all we need what was so what was the can you go to the next slide maybe after that um, this one. So there, so there, the, the next evolution, I don't know the correct. Oh word, yeah. Yeah. So that was this one. evolution after that is basically saying, I don't need 100% evaluation. I don't need to keep doing it until convergence. I can just continually improve my, my, um, my policy evaluation and my, um, policy at the same time, right? So you're not doing 20 plus um, episodes, you can just do yep. one and you can just kind of alternate back and forth. And you might not have a 100% accurate policy evaluation, but it doesn't matter because you're generally moving in the right direction. Yeah, so, so in the video, when they go and they figure out, I, don't, I, I couldn't hear the audio, so I don't know, but they, they go and they figure out that this thing converges. Um, I, let, let's just say it's, it's a thousand iterations and it gets to this delta being less than 0.001. All right. Well, it turns out that if they had just done like two, let me see if I can find it. Come on. It's a little bit more. Right? So like if they had just done this, <laughs> okay, that would have been enough to say that if you're in this square, go left and then go left again. And if you're in this square, go up and then go up again, right? And so like these, these um, it, for, for pretty much every square, except for this square and that square, you would know exactly if you just said, what's the, the greedy best policy for me? Oh, no, no, the corner as well. So this diagonal, so just two iterations of, of evaluation um, would then get you a policy that's optimal for everything except for these four on the diagonal. And so instead of doing, what, what, what number did I say? A thousand iterations of evaluation, we could have just done two. Because mm. again, your value function don't need to be that perfect. They, they need to be sort of you know, ordered in order to get the best policy. And so if we had just done two iterations, improved the policy, and then done two iterations and improved the policy, we would have been done. Mm -hmm. So like a total of six steps, as opposed to we did a thousand iterations because you know we didn't know how good we needed to be before we did a single improvement. And so that's why generally speaking, you tend to push towards shorter evaluation. And then you know whether or not you're improving will actually tell you whether or not you need to keep going as opposed to you know, or, or else you could have just said, well, I should have picked my delta to be a lot bigger than 0.001. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then we would have just, you know, stopped sooner. Right. 
but but in any either way the idea is that you're going to push towards doing um, shorter and smaller and then that'll also give you some flexibility in terms of how you want to combine things because ultimately when you get to bigger problems these sweeps are just going to be massive and expensive mm -hmm. And so then, then the, the step beyond that, the asynchronous dynamic programming, that's mm -hmm. just making an individual move and then saying, let's, let's optimize for that right away. Because you, yeah. you have one to minus 10 and you say immediately, I know that that's a bad, bad position. So instead of playing the entire thing to the end, you could just say directly right there, make an update and, and don't try not to land on the minus 10 again. Yeah, exactly. So, so like if people know chess, you know, like there may be some situation where, you know, you just put your, your queen in harm's way and the, you know, and, and immediately gets taken the next move. Well, you probably don't need to like keep exploring over and over again and exhaustively figuring out, well, exactly how bad is this move? Is it like really bad, terrible bad, end of the world bad? It, it doesn't matter. You, you know, you very quickly know that it's, it's, a ter it's, a, it's a bad move. And so, so you can focus your energy if you're doing value updates on, well, but is it better to move my knight or better to move my bishop? That, that, that may not be clear at all, which is better. Yeah, cool. So that's all right. my understanding of things. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. And, and, and again, um, for people who uh, are interested, you're, you know, I welcome people either trying to read the book before or going and taking a look at the chapters now um, after we've kind of done this high level overview. So if you're interested in a deeper understanding with what you just recapped, Ryan, that's enough to then uh, for us to talk about the Monte Carlo methods and ultimately get into these other met methods. You don't need to know all the theory in order to understand ultimately like we talk about temporal difference learning which will get us to q learning deep q learning and so we're not technically we're not that far off from once we have this general policy iteration we're really not that far off from the really gnarly advanced techniques that are going on today um, and what will be interesting is it's not necessarily all going to be in the Sutton and Bardo book but to talk about um, why they come up with these different algorithms really has more to do with like trying to get it to converge, trying to deal with like the, 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 the variance um, uh, of these models. They're not really gonna be that much more complicated than what we just saw here today in terms of the underlying how they improve. Because pretty much everything is just gonna be a tweak on this generalized policy iteration. You're going to have some kind of value function and you're going to have some sort of um, policy that you, you keep incrementing both of those. All right. Well, thanks. I know that we're um, um, way over time. So this, so we covered just chapter four, the, the, the dynamic programming part. I think I got the chapter numbers right. Um, but so this is just the dynamic programming part. Again, dynamic programming is used theoretically for small problems, but this, this underpinning of generalized policy iteration is just really great. So even though we introduce this in a nice confined theoretical world where we fully know the dynamics of the environment, now we talk about Monte Carlo and we're gonna, we're gonna strip away lots of requirements. We will no longer need to know the dynamics. We won't even need to know the states. Um, and so uh, this is where we get into real algorithms. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Thank you. I'm looking forward to how we don't need to know states. <laughs>